One of the most fascinating and exciting things for me is to watch somebody who is an expert in their field work. Uh, for example, um, I have found it a great joy to watch Andy Melsop work on plumbing at my house. Now it's true, I'm, I was excited to get some plumbing problems fixed, but it was interesting as I was looking at the problem and I couldn't figure it out, I didn't know how it worked, the individual ingredients seemed uh, mysterious to me, that Andy and his crew would come over and so quickly not only diagnose the problem and know the solution, but then would be able to take that and so quickly solve it. David Cipriano has come over to our home at times and we've asked him to move a wall to make one room bigger or make one room smaller. And as I look at a wall and I begin to think about the individual parts of the wall and I begin to think about uh, how to do it, it I, I find myself running up against a wall, metaphorically, not knowing the next step to take. And even if I knew the next steps, the ability then to translate that into an actual uh, finished project seems impossible. But David comes over, he sees what's going on, he knows the individual parts, he knows about load-bearing this and load-bearing that, and in a matter of a week he has a wall moved. Watching Pam Mitchell cook a meal or make scones, which is one of her specialties, uh, I look at her, even if I have a recipe in front of me, there is no intuitiveness in my life to know how to take these individual parts and make something beautiful. Somebody who is a gifted administrator, somebody who is a gifted uh, financer, uh, somebody who's gifted uh, in teaching children, I don't care what the discipline is, it is exciting to me though to watch somebody who is an expert in their field really work and produce something really beautiful. As believers in Jesus Christ, as Christians, one of the things that we ought to be an expert in is relationships. We ought to know the individual aspect of relationships. We ought to know what grows a relationship. We ought to know what barriers keep relationships from flourishing. We ought to know how trust in, um, impacts relationships and uh, how broken trust can be restored and, and how all of this works together to bring about peace and rest. We ought to be relationship experts with God. We ought to be relationship experts with one another. I say this today because God is a relationship expert. Now it's true, he has a leg up on us in the sense that he created the concept of relationships. He is all-knowing and almighty, and uh, he has set up the pattern and the process. But as we learn from God, we ought to learn that God is a relating God who expects us to live and wants to live in relationship with him. And therefore, as his image bears then to take those same principles and live in good and godly relationships with one another. I believe here at Calvary over the last six months, we've been looking at some specific concepts. We've looked at the issue of rest. We've looked at the issue of trust. And we've looked at this idea how God creates us to live in relationship with him and others as worshipers. And as we seek to be relationship experts today, I would like to take these three concepts and not step away from our study, but step back from our study to see how these three things work together. How relationships work, how relationships work with trust, and then how relationships built on trust lead to rest. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to spend our morning in two passages. I'd like to spend a little bit of time in Numbers 13, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time in Hebrews 3 and 4 as we look at becoming experts in relationship. The first thing I want to do this morning is I want to look at the two basic ingredients of building a relationship. 
then I want to look at how trust interacts in relationships and how these two ingredients along with trust bring relationship rest. Well, let me catch us up to speed on where we have been, uh, Numbers 13, 30 through 14, 4 and Hebrews 3 and 4. God has chosen to have a unique relationship with the nation of Israel. That's Abraham's family. They have been in Egypt for generations as slaves to the Egyptian nation. And a little while ago in Numbers 13, we find that God has liberated them from slavery. He's brought them into freedom and he's moving them to their promised land of rest. Now, they believe that God exists, and they've seen his power not only in the ten plagues, but in the giving of freedom. And at Mount Sinai, God comes and dwells on top of that mountain with Moses. He meets with Moses 40 days and 40 nights. But during that time, Israel begins to be afraid. And so as a result, they turn to what they know, idolatry. They build a golden calf to which they ascribe to be the visible representation of the God who has liberated them. And as a result, God and Moses become angry over their idolatry. Now, Israel knows God exists and they've seen his power. But as they move from Mount Sinai onto the front door of the promised land of Resh at Kadesh Barnea, After they see the giants in the land and they become afraid again, they refuse to enter where God is taking them. Not because they don't believe God exists, but because they don't trust God. And so because they don't trust God, and I would suggest because they don't really understand and have a relationship with God, they forfeit the rest that God promised. I think as we look at their story, their story looks very familiar to ours, even as believers in Jesus Christ. As Christians, we're called to live with and for God in a relationship with him. But sometimes we become anxious. Sometimes we become fearful. Sometimes we become selfish. And rather than obey God, because we don't trust God, We choose other means of worship and relationship, and we forfeit the rest that he offers. Let's pick up here in chapter 13, verse 30. says, after they came back, the the 12 spies come back from spying out the land. It says in verse 30, But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy the land, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people because they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, uh, who came from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we also seem to them. Then all of the congregation of Israel raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader to go back to Egypt. Now later in chapter 14, we see as a result of their unwillingness to trust God and obey God, not only do they forfeit the rest of the promised land, but they end up now wandering 40 years in the wilderness until the rebellious generation dies off and a new generation is ready to move in. We see in Hebrews chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 11, what we see narrated for us in Numbers 13, we see explained to us in Hebrews 3. 
says this in verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Scripture says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And then he says down in verse 19, So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief or their unwillingness to trust God. So here we have a group of people that God has called to live in a loving relationship with him. They know him. They know about him, some things. But when the rubber meets the road, they don't trust him. And as a result of not trusting God, they don't obey God, and then they forfeit the rest that God offers. I'm going to suggest to you, even in our human relationships, it works often the same. Because we don't have an, a growing relationship with somebody, we generally do not trust those people. And as a result, we don't have rest in our relationships, whether in our home or in our church or in our walk with God. So how does God build relationship? And we're going to look at that here. And we're going to look at how then we can contribute to the relationship and trust and rest that we have in Christ, as well as what we can have with one another. So when God builds a relationship with us, he does two things. And these are two ingredients, two building blocks of every relationship. When God wants to build a relationship with us, the first thing he does is he shares who he is. He shares who he is. Friendship, relationship, is built on sharing who you are and others sharing who they are with you. It's interesting when God sends Moses into Egypt to liberate the Israelites, Moses says, they're going to ask me who you are. And so God says, you tell them my name. My name is I am that I am. Moses takes what God has revealed about himself to the Israelites. Sure enough, they say, well, who is this God? Because they see lots of gods in Egypt. And Moses says, this is the I am that I am. From that moment on, God does what he does in so many ways to share with Israel who he is. The giving of the law is to explain to Israel who he is. Even though Israel rebels against God and wanders in the wilderness, the whole book of Genesis is about God sharing who God is with Israel. Even Genesis 1 and 2 that we've already looked at, God makes Adam. The first thing he does is speak to Adam about who he is, who Adam is, and about to Adam who God is. He walks and he walks and talks with Adam and Eve about who he is in the garden. Everything about what God, who God is and what God does in building a relationship with us is about sharing who he is with us. So we would say the first building block of relationship is revelation. Revealing who we are or who God is to other people. It is impossible to build a deeper relationship with someone who only talks about superficial things. If the only thing that a person wants to talk about is the weather or the latest sitcom, you can build um, a strong acquaintance with them, but there will be a cap on how high or how deep the relationship will go. Thus, relationships deepen as revelation is reciprocated between two people. Jill and I have known each other for 36 years. We have not always shared the same amount uh, of depth with each other as we have in our married life. As a result, we would say that our relationship has grown deeper over time because of the willingness to share deeper and deeper things about who we are. I want you to think this morning of your best friend. 
your best friend is probably your best friend because they share things with you and you share things with them that you can't share with anyone else. If you find a person that walks closely with God, it's probably because that person has listened a lot to God and they have shared a lot of their life with God. It's interesting there in that Hebrews 3 and 4 section on trust and rest, which is about relationship. And he, right on the heels of that in chapter 4, 11 and 12, he says, Let us strive then to enter that rest, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the reception of God's word and the willingness to take it in and respond back that is the first building block of building a relationship. So Israel doesn't know anything about God coming out of Egypt, or very little, except that God's all-powerful. And even though the wilderness wandering looks like a punishment, and it is, it is also a training ground for God to share who he is and for Israel to take that in and to relate back. So the first building block or ingredient of a relationship is sharing who we are or revelation. The second ingredient is time spent together time spent together. Israel is going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, but she is not going to wander in the wilderness alone. It's interesting, even at Mount Sinai, God has commissioned a tabernacle, a home to be built, um, a mobile home. That wherever God goes, he wants Israel to go with him, and everywhere that Israel goes, God is right in the midst of her. God gives very specific instructions so that he can live in the midst of Israel and so that he can spend time with her. Exodus 40, 33 through 38 says, He erected the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the veil for the gateway of the court. Thus Moses finished the tabernacle. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. The cloud and the fire are simply physical manifestations of the glory of God in the tabernacle. Who's in the tabernacle? God's in the tabernacle. Why? Because he wants to be with his people. Genesis 1 and 2, God doesn't just create Adam and Eve and then go away. He creates Adam and Eve, and then he spends time with Adam and Eve. And even afterwards, God begins, God even covers Adam and Eve with, with skins so that he could be with them to cover their shame so he could spend time with them. And we see even here God's liberation of Israel from Egypt is not just so they can go out and do his will, but so that he can be with them, he can live with them, and they with him. I, I bring all that up to kind of coalesce this idea that the rest and trust that we've been looking at, and we'll look at deeper here in a second, begins with this idea of relationship, that a relational God who relates within his Trinitarian nature also wants to relate with Adam and Eve and their descendants. And even after we sin in Genesis 3, God is pursuing relationship with us. How? He continues to share who he is and he continues to desire to spend time. If we don't, my question this morning is, if we don't sense that we have a close relationship with God, what has broken down? Because God has shown himself to be interested in a relationship with us. Jesus Christ, the word, right, expressing who God is, comes to live among us so that he can forgive our sins, so that he can live in us, as we take the written word and the indwelling word, work together to impart to us who God is. What is that? That's relationship. My question this morning is, how are we not reciprocating with God? Are we spending time with him? 
Are we honest in sharing our heart with him? Are we listening to his word? Are we listening to the Spirit's guidance? So both revelation of self and time is required for any type of relationship to begin or deepen. And as both are invested, both time and revelation, something happens. And that is this, trust is given fertile soil to grow. So here it is, as our relationship, as we invest time and as we invest revelation of ourself and as God has invested that in us, something happens. Trust begins to become a part of that relationship and as the relationship deepens, so does trust. Listen, Israel believes that God exists, but she doesn't trust him. Jonathan Edwards makes a unique distinction among this idea of faith. He says, there's an aspect of faith that is knowing. I know that God exists. He says, then there is that aspect of belief. I not only know it, but I believe it in my heart. But then there is that necessary next step where I begin to embrace that or trust my life in that and then order my life around it. Israel knows that God exists, she believes that God exists, but she won't obey God because she doesn't, I think, trust God. Well, I don't think. Hebrews 3 and 4 says that they didn't trust him. So what does God do? Certainly he sends God, uh, Israel into the wilderness for 40 years, but he does more than that. He uses that 40 years to build a relationship by revealing who he is, through his word, through Genesis and the Pentateuch, and through Israel experiencing time and life together with him. As a result, Israel begins to understand who God is and begins to see him at work in real life, and trust begins to grow. When we talk about person having integrity, what we're talking about is a person who not only says the right things, but they do what they do and say match up. And, you know, it takes time to know if what a person says or who a person says that they are is, in fact, who they are. And when we see that what they say is who they are, we begin to realize that they are a trustworthy person. And as they share more and as we spend more time and we see that integrity and we see that consistency, we begin to understand that this person is even more trustworthy. This deepens the relationship and, the sh and so more is shared and more and more trust deepens too. If you think about your best friend, you would realize your best friend didn't start out as your best friend. Your best friend was somebody that you found uh, to be someone that you would like to know more about. And so you spent time with them. And as more was shared, you begin to realize this is a trustworthy person. I can share more of me with them. And then when they were trustworthy with that, I can share more of me with them and vice versa. And so you find this person can be trusted with your heart and with, your, with, your, with the dark parts of you as well as the good parts of you. And so as that relationship grows, trust grows true too. I think the same goes with God. It makes sense that a person who walks the Christian life longer as we experience more of God's goodness and his trustworthiness in our life, that he's not just out to manipulate us, but he's out to care for us. That as we go through a pandemic, we're able to look back on a whole host of ways that God has been trustworthy in the past. And even though we don't necessarily know what's coming in our tomorrows, we can say, but I trust God. And so that's built on a relationship where he has shared with us, we have shared with him, where we have spent time with him and he with us and trust has grown as we realize that God is full of integrity. So one of the things we often hear, or we might even often say is this, trust is not earned, or trust is not given, it's earned. And I would suggest to you today that that is kind of right and kind of wrong. In one way, trust is earned. 
It's interesting, in the wilderness, God proves himself again and again that he is trustworthy. Does God have to do that for Israel? No, but because he wants a relationship with them, he is willing to prove his trustworthiness. So in one way, God is trying to earn the trust of Israel. If you want to have a relationship with a person, you have got to demonstrate that you are a trustworthy individual. A person who gossips to me about another person is probably not a person that I'm going to trust with the deep things of my life. Do you get what I'm saying? If they've shown themselves untrustworthy in that relationship, they're probably not going to be somebody who's trustworthy with the things of my life. There needs to be an earning of that. But on the other hand, trust is also given. The most trustworthy person in the universe is God. And yet Israel won't trust her at Kadesh Barnea. There are types of people, maybe because of their personality, maybe because of past experiences, that no matter how trustworthy you show yourself, they are not going to trust you with their life. They're not going to trust you with who they are. And as a result of that, there's going to be a ceiling on how close you can be to that person. So as you look at the issue of trust, God proves he's trustworthy. Why? Because of the things that he's sharing about himself and the consistency that he demonstrates that over a period of time. So these two ingredients build relationship. Trust is built. Trust is earned. And then as a result, we see rest become a part of the relationship. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19, so we see that they were unable to enter the rest because of distrust. As trust deepens, so does my comfortability and my peace around that person. Why? Because as I have revealed myself to them more and more over time, and they to me, and I begin to trust that person deeper and deeper, and more and more, I become more comfortable with that person. I could say that I am more at rest with that person. I can be me with that person. I don't fear rejection. I don't fear isolation. I don't, I don't fear slander and gossip. I don't feel fear that they will stab me in the back. Why? Because over time, we have revealed to each other and we have found one another to be trustworthy. It's interesting. In John 15, 4, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. The word abide here means to remain or to dwell or to make your home in me. In Ephesians, Paul tells, um, uh, as a part of his prayer, he prays for the Ephesians that they would abide in Christ and that Christ would abide in them, that even as Christians, that, we, that Jesus would be able to make his home in us and we would make our home in him. How can we do that? As trust builds, the more time and revelation that we experience and that we know trust builds and rest results. You know, the best parts of our home are like that. When we think of home and the way it should be, we recognize that it's a place of love and acceptance. But it's also a place of partnership and togetherness. The promised land for Israel is going to be a land of rest. We see that in Hebrews 3 and 4. Not a no work kind of rest, but a land where they will partner with God and they will work with God and for God. And as a result, God is going to bring them a peace of heart in mind that they never experienced when they were in slavery in Egypt. I want to suggest to you today <clears throat> that you can have a perfect peace in the midst of a pandemic. And the way that we can have that peace, that rest, is based upon whether or not we trust God. As we trust God more, rest grows more as well. So as we, as we deepen in our relationship with God by knowing and studying who he is and listening to him, and as we spend time with him over a long period of time, and as that trust grows, that rest grows as well. 
The peace that we desire, especially in the midst of national or personal crisis, is only found as a result of living in a growing relationship and deepening trust in Christ. As we grow in our trust of Christ, we don't have to know the future. We can rest assured that he will care for us and use us in his plan as we live in relationship with him. Listen, there's a lot more that can be said about relationships. There's a lot more that needs to be known for us to be relationship experts. But when we boil it all down, a relationship expert is going to be this. Someone who knows that relationships are built on revelation and time. These are two building blocks that cannot be violated and there be a relationship, a deepening one anyway. As time and revelation are invested and reciprocated, trust grows. And the greater the trust, the greater the rest. So as we step back from our study of Genesis, um, we're not stepping away from it. I think in some ways we're stepping into it as we realize that Genesis is not a book given to us so that we can have a detailed explanation of the beginning of all things. We recognize that Genesis is a book written by a relational God to a people that don't know who he is, but a people that he wants to have a relationship with. So he shows them who he is. He spends time with them in the tabernacle in the wilderness. They begin to trust him. And in 40 years from now, under the leadership of Joshua, God is going to send them in. And this time, guess what? They're going to be a, little, they're going to be a lot afraid. They've got a big task in front of them. But you know what they do? They trust. And how do we know that? They obey. And even though they don't experience all the rest they could, they experience a greater rest than they've ever experienced. That's my prayer for you. And that's my prayer for me as a church and as a family, that we would become relationship experts. Relationship has two ingredients. Trust is built based upon that. And rest in relationships is the result. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the direction that you give us that just like a plumber hones his craft, uh, just like a seamstress learns and grows even if she is an expert, just as a chef would go through um, uh, chef 101, but would need to grow in his understanding over the long course of his or her career. We pray, Father, and under, ask that you would help us to understand not just the basics of relationships that we've covered today, but, Father, we would add now to this, and we would become a kind of people that know how relationships work at, at least at least in a basic way so that, that we're not stumped while we're not closer with you and that we can take progressive, active measures to grow closer to you. That, Father, we wouldn't be stumped as to why we can't be closer friends with some people or why some people just won't be our friend. And, Father, we won't live in the, same, in the shame and the guilt of something that is unreciprocated. But, Father, help us to live knowledgeably as so much of our life has to deal with relating with you and re relating to our neighbor. Pray, Father, that you would bless us and keep us. Uh, may your face shine upon us as we seek to live in right relationship with you and with others. In Jesus' name, amen.